Hi everyone, welcome back to Breaking Barriers Now. My guest today is just absolutely amazing just from what I've been able to know of her in the short amount of time that we've kind of chatted back and forth. Her story is just, it's gonna be amazing and impactful, I already know it. Uh, I'm gonna let her unpack it a whole lot. Her name is Joanne Richards. She is doing a lot of things right now, but she is an author and she is here to help people transform their lives simply by sharing her own experiences. And I think at the end of the day, the more of us that are willing to be vulnerable and share things that might not have been easy to share back in the day, <laughs> seems like that gives us this, this amazing power to be able to help other people. And so thank you so much for taking the time out to come on today. Um, you bet. And just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, where you're from and and let's just unpack this this story that you have. <laughs> it's a big onion. Well, <laughs> we all have them, so it's okay. <laughs> it's a big onion. <laughs> okay, I grew up in California, Southern California mostly, in the, the suburbs of Los Angeles. <clears throat> I'm a family of four kids. My mom was basically a stay-at-home mom. My dad I guess you'd say he was in the finance industry, but he was like management. So it's not like he was an accountant like I am. Um, anyway, so grew up pretty typical. I say pretty typical dysfunctional, you know, family life like most people do. But, you know, I thought most things were OK, except, you know, my dad was an alcoholic and my grandma was an alcoholic, apparently. So this kind of ran in the family and my mom. I didn't know what it was called back then, but she was a codependent and that's where I have my codependent genes from. So, you know, I grew up and then when I was 10, 11, 12, you know, I got interested in the Mormon church because my best friend was her family was Mormon. So, and my family didn't really go to church. So I really liked it. And I started going to church and I was a Mormon for 30 years. So that's kind of the backstory for a lot of my, I mean, the church did not cause my problems, but, um, you know, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, so it's the Leave it to Beaver, you know, Donna Reed, the white picket fence, you know, you wear your pearls yeah. all day long while you're doing the dishes, you know. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I just grew up with this, this image that um, I, I want to get married, live happily ever after, have the white picket fence, have a bunch of kids. And so, and in the Mormon church, the belief extends beyond that. It's like you're married forever and you have a big pack of kids. And usually, you know, the, yeah. you know, they like big families. And so that's all cool. But I, there are a lot of positive family values <clears throat> in the church. Anyway, I, I went away to school. You know, I went to Brigham Young University. And the first guy I married was, was Mormon, but not, you know, he wasn't a return missionary and he didn't go to BYU. But you know, he went to another university in, in Utah and we, we courted often well, we courted and then we got married, you know, we met like uh, December and we were married by the following August. And my belief wow. was always that, yeah, my number one problem is I always courted too quick, you know, too, the courtships were too short, mm. very too short, you know, <laughs> a month to two months or three months. Oh, it was like they were less than a year. It's like, I never dated anybody for a year except the current husband. But, um, you know, I always thought that if I married somebody in the church, then things were magically going to be fine. <laughs> and, you know, if they're a member of the church and we both believe we should be praying together and going to church together and serving together and do all these wonderful, you know, faith-based things. And naturally we both want a lot of kids and naturally, I just assumed we naturally wanted the same things. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've learned through five bad Mormon marriages that that wasn't wow. the case. Yeah. Two, two husbands. You, okay. Right at the gate people. I'm on marriage number seven. <laughs> That's always the clincher. I, I, look, I always tell people don't give up. <laughs> so you are the epitome no. of don't and give that's, up. That's it. You know, my daughter said, you know, you trusted in love mom. You just picked the wrong people, but, and she's right. And in the meantime, I put myself through hell and I put my daughter through hell. And, mm. you know, it, it's we're we're coming back around to where we're healing from that those things that we had never talked about, like what I put her mm. through. But I kept picking the wrong guys and we didn't court long enough. 
And like I said, I thought, well, if we're both members of the church, then things are magically going to be fine because, you know, we believe in the same spiritual principles. Well, but you have to look at the person, not just because they're a member of your church. There you and, go. <laughs> and, and the other problem was at least the men I picked, they looked great at church and to everybody else. And at home, they're not so great, you know, mm. this and and again, and I don't know how it is in other religions, but, you know, in the Mormon church, you're not taught that the, the, the husband rules over you and dominates you, but you're, you're supposed to be equal partners. And I totally mm -hmm. believe in that. But it's also the man is supposed to be the head of the household. So you get this idea that, you know, you're supposed to like defer to him. And, you know, so again, big misconception and. I've let my husband now, my current husband's like, you know, eh, <laughs> you don't rule me, dude. <laughs> I am your equal partner. And, but it's taken me 20 years to even say that. So, yeah. wow. but anyway, so, you know, it was, it was really hard being married to these Mormons who thought they needed to rule the house and rule with an iron fist in some, in some cases. So I went through a string of abusive relationships, physically, mentally, and financially. I've been through mm. the gamut. I was never beaten to a pulp, which was thank I'm thankful, but my daughter got hit as a toddler. I got hit. Mm. And you know, no, I never went to the hospital, but the the damage is still there. And mm. you know, the questions always rise is like, well, why didn't you call the police? Why didn't you go tell your church leaders? And I, you know, I don't know why. I just I didn't. And I'm I'm not beating myself up for it now, but it's like, I'm, you know, that's, that causes me great angst that I didn't because I came home one day from doing a church service project and my, I think she was still only two. She could have been three, but okay. My toddler preschooler was lying on the couch in her little pink robe with a huge bruise on her face. And the husband was, he was probably in, he was either watching TV or in the kitchen doing something. And it's like, I don't know what she, I still don't know to this day what she did to make him mad. But, you know, and he was a big guy and he just backhanded her. And, mm. and then of course he gets all sorry. And, you know, she's on the couch being not really tended to. She was just on the couch laying there. I don't even know if she had ice on her face, but, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, I can't even go do church service and you're hitting my kid. Wow. And, you know, I, I let him adopt her because again, we were trying to create this big, happy family and that would have been the way to go. And, you know, I, I've been accused of, you know, marrying him and letting him adopt her just so I could get all this child support. Well, people, it took me a couple of years to, you know, get that divorce finalized and even get a hundred bucks a month out of him mm. if I got it. And I usually had to wait till he got a tax refund. <laughs> so so yeah. what did that, I mean, I can, I can't even... I can't imagine. What did that yeah. do to you? Like when you saw your daughter like that? Uh, I, I was heartbroken and mad, but again, it's like, I, I, silly me. I didn't, I should have called the police and I should have found a way to leave. And that's, well, we can't go I back. Yeah. No, Just I can't, remember, go we can't go back. Can't go and back. I finally yeah. did leave. I left between two blizzards and I, he, he was a ambulance, you know, person, EMT. Okay. And one day he came home after like a couple days shift and I was ready to go. I had, while he was gone, I had like everything packed. Somebody helped me ship it off. And I had, you know, already called my mom and it's like, I need help getting out of here. And you know, they got me a plane ticket and I, he came home and I said, you're driving us to the airport. We're leaving. You got nothing to say about it. And wow. thankfully the blizzards had stopped long enough because I was living in Ohio at the time. Oh, and it's like driving to <laughs> Cleveland after a blizzard and we're in a little, were we in a Volkswagen? I don't know. We were oh, in a small goodness. car and to drive on the snowy roads to Cleveland, you know, it was, it was crazy, but I, it's like, I got to go, you know, we're, we're yeah. leaving in, you know, sayonara. So <laughs> that, that was hard, but I, I would, you know, uh, anybody, women or men, you know, who's ever, if you're in an abusive relationship, have the courage to get the help and, leave if you you know yeah they're not going to change they do not change and and it's funny because somebody interviewed his uh, his other daughter years later and it's like 
oh, he was the nicest father. And I'm going, yeah, I'm not, you know, it's like, did he magically change? I don't, I don't know of most abusive people that change, you know, so, but, you know, maybe he had a magic change of heart and he never hit those other kids. I don't know, but yeah, you know, I, I had enough of that. Well, kudos so, you to you know, for leaving. I mean, that's, that's a difficult yeah, I've known a lot of women that have been in that position. Actually, I was the child of of, of a mom who did get hit a lot. And so mm. I saw that. That's what I saw growing up. And so um, and she she couldn't leave, you know, and, and I, you know, God rest her soul, but she couldn't leave. And, you know, so anyone who finds the, you know, guts to do that, like, I commend you because that's a Thank difficult you. Thank you. place to be. Well, and it, it's interesting because, again, my daughter, um, remarked to me one day it's like most of the relationships lasted maybe a year that one if you include the t time it took to get a divorce took five years and there was one other guy I was with for five years but most of them it's like once I knew I had to go I just you know I went and it's like I didn't take a ton of time it's like okay you're not working out dude I've been through this too many times to wonder if it's going to work out and okay you've just told me you're not going to go to therapy with me well okay, if we, if you still think it's all my problem, then I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't think I gave up lightly, you know, it wasn't like, oh, let's get married. Oh, it's not working. Okay. Bye. You know, I'm not right. happy. So I, I really did try hard and I really did try to do my part to make the relationship work. But, you know, if the, if the partner thinks it's all your fault, all your problems, okay, that's a clear red flag. And, if your partner thinks, oh, you don't have a real job because you're just doing bookkeeping, that's another real flag. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> I'm using my brain, dude. Yeah, and exactly. It's got to be a lot harder than delivering ice cream and milk. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, no offense. Everybody's job is important. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, my, I no, think mine's a little more saying, brain though. taxing. But yeah. it just the, the, the verbal abuse and, you know, you're not better than me we're, we're yeah. equal here, you know, and we all come from the same place and you are not better than me. I don't care what our jobs are. Yeah. I, you know, I don't care what your background is. You just know you're not better than me. And I'm not saying yeah. I'm better than anybody else. I think we're all right. on equal footing. Um, and our trials and tribulations are different, but whatever. But so in, in a nutshell, uh, you know, I went through crazy, crazy situations and got out of it. And my daughter's father, he was the shortest courtship. He was a month and we were married. And thankfully so, because I ended up being pregnant before we got married, even though I didn't know that. And these podcasts have given me the power to say that out loud. Yeah. <laughs> because oh, nice. that's not something I ever talked about. And you certainly didn't go to church and start counting down how long you've been pregnant versus married. <laughs> and, you know, I think one girlfriend that's figured true. it out, but uh yeah, it's like, oh man. And I, you know, it's like, it's not like I was super fertile. So I had fertility issues, but I, and we weren't obviously trying in the month we were courting. We were just playing around. And, but um, they, you know, it's like, then I was getting sick all the time. And finally, my doctor said, Are you sure this is not the flu? <laughs> I go, Well, I don't know because my husband's had the flu too. But, well, let's take oh, a pregnancy goodness. test. It's like, Oh, I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it, it it was a big surprise and it's the only time I've been pregnant since and so she's you know I one day I thought it's like I'll have 12 kids I, you know I'm a Mormon I'm gonna have 12 kids well and I, I lost a good boyfriend because I wanted a ton of kids and he didn't you know but um you know I had one I have one great daughter I have grand I have great grandchildren and, you know, that's that's what the universe had in, in mind for me, because if I had had kids with every husband, number one, that would have been more than I could have handled. And number yeah. two, it's like, you know, the current husband would not have looked at me twice. It's like that would have been a little <laughs> too much baggage for him. <laughs> well, let's my, talk because you have you have some information on on your, you know, your biography or it talks about financial ruin and then um, also a spouse's suicide. That, yeah, daughter, daughter number two, no, daughter, my daughter's father, um, we courted for a month, so I didn't know him as well as I would have liked to, and, you know, he, 
his sister said, why don't you go to this Mormon singles activity? And we met, you know, he wasn't a Mormon. And they, again, they thought, well, if, if he, you know, meets up and marries a nice Mormon girl, that'll take care of all his problems. It turns out he got injured in the Navy years before that and got addicted to Valium and he drank too much and he smoked pot. And this was way, you know, in the seventies. So pot wasn't mm -hmm. legal. So here I am pregnant, we got married and and then I'm finding out, oh, you drink too much. Oh, you take Valium more than I thought you did. And you wanna smoke pot. And we have pot in the house and I'm a Mormon and I don't believe in that and I'm pregnant. And you wanna blow pot in my face while I'm pregnant. And you drove, oh, you had me drive with you to go buy the pot. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, we're gonna get arrested. <laughs> oh my goodness. And, and today, obviously, you know, it's legal and I, I live in a state now where it's very open and, and in California it is too, but you know, it's like that freaked me out. And so he, and he had some mental health issues. He was depressed a lot. And I guess he was, you know, had those problems before, you know, long before I met him, but his family yeah. thought I would straighten him out. Well, that didn't, you know, you, do, you don't, you don't change the other person. You can't they fix have anyone. To change. Yeah, so exactly. You know, um, when I was in the hospital having my daughter and then recuperating there because I had a cesarean, um, you know, I tried calling him and the phone would just ring and ring and ring. Well, he'd undone the ringer from the phone because he was, you know, he was mentally, mentally, he had some, he was depressed. Um, mm. And I finally got a hold of him or his family finally got a hold of him and said, hey, you know, your daughter's born, you know, go, you know. And so I, I saw him, he came and visited me. He, he had kicked me, oh, here's the thing. He had kicked me out when I was seven months pregnant because he was feeling suicidal back then. And, you know, we were just clashing. So thankfully he kicked me out so that I wasn't part of his suicide. And mm. so he saw and he thought I would move home as soon as I had the daughter. And I said, no, you know, you need to, we need to work on this. And, you know, we're about to get a, you know, we're, we're heading to divorce and we need to work on some things and you need to work on your mental health, basically. And he saw her two times. And when she was five weeks old, he committed suicide. Jesus. So even though he and I would have never stayed together, she grew up without a father. She grew up without her biological father. Yeah. Thankfully, we stayed close with her grandparents, okay. his parents and his family. And that was that was lovely. And they were fabulous people. So I'm, I'm grateful that they kept me and kept her in their lives. Obviously her, but they kept me and the, they always thought I was a, a daughter-in-law. They always saw me as a daughter-in-law, which was lovely. That's good. Even though yeah, I kept good. getting married and, you know, it's like they just, well, you know, <laughs> they wanted me to be happy. So that, that was hard. And um, I don't, you know, I don't know that she's got total closure on that. I think they're finally, because she has his ashes in her house. And I think mm. finally her, both of her grandparents are gone. And now her, her aunt and cousin, they're going to all get together this summer and, you know, scatter the, everybody's ashes or some of That's everybody's good. ashes. And, yeah. and, and deal. so like there's two grandparents and her dad, and they'll take them to the, one of their favorite spots. They're going to um, go over to Catalina Island in, in, you know, off of Los Angeles and, mm. um, you know, have a little bit more family memorial. And that'll be great because right. that's closure that they all need, which is, which is fabulous. Yeah. So that was suicide. I did have, you know, husband number five uh, fi ruined me financially, invested some money in a way he shouldn't have and lost it all. And then I had to repay it back to the person whose money we were managing. Mm. So, so that was, that was hard. And um, I finally, you know, it's like I had to sue him. I had to put a lien on his house for when he sold it finally, because I had to file bankruptcy because all of a sudden, you know, now I'm accumulating all this debt and we split up and I'm accumulating more debt and all the collectors are calling. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm working, maybe I was working full-time by then, but it was, it was rough. And you know, it's not like he, you know, he could barely survive financially himself. So it's not like I ever got alimony from anybody, mm. <laughs> anybody. And it's like, like I said, I barely got any child support out of that one guy. And um, I finally had to sue him and he sold his house and he had to give me the money, which was great. Cause then I could pay back, you know, the person yeah. money that I shouldn't have used anyway. So 
that was another big boo-boo. So I'm very cautious. You know, I am a bookkeeper, but even bookkeepers, you know, make financial boo-boos in their personal life. So I've, right. I've had to, you know, fix my credit. I've had to, you know, I've, I'm, I'm doing very well. You know, my business, my bookkeeping business is thriving and I'm, I'm making more, I'm making more than enough. So That's I can good. put some money in savings and, yeah. Yeah, but you know, it's funny because I, I didn't start saving for retirement until I was 60, which is way too late. So another, another, <laughs> to, to hey, that gives daughter, a lot of people hope. Sick. Okay. <laughs> I keep telling my daughters, put 10 bucks away, to put 50 yeah. bucks a month away, do something. Don't just, because, and she's doing very, it's like, you know, it's like, it's great to be paying off your credit card debt and not have a lot of debt. But you also need to have some money going towards retirement because, yeah. you know, I have a SEP IRA, but if I had to retire right now and which I would love to do, I'm old enough to retire more than old enough to retire. But if I had to, I could maybe live on, for a year or two on what's in my SEP IRA. <laughs> and, and now it's like, oh, I need to ramp things up. And, you know, I am sending my my financial planner more, you know, more. I mean, I do. They do get money every month and now I'm okay. Here's another little chunk. Here's an extra chunk. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to do that more and more. So that's good. I, I've had to learn, you know, I just, you know, it's like, I don't want to get caught because I always thought again, okay, well the husband will take care of me and the husband will have a pension. Okay. Well now we, we could skip to husband number seven and husband number seven's in prison. So <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. So we got to unpack I this. I don't know if you're right. that part. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do remember you talking about that. And I, and yeah. So, okay. Let, let me ask you this. So, okay. So now you've been through six. I've been through what six. What was the turning point for you? Like, what was your kind of non-negotiables at that point? Like what the light switch came on, right? Like, okay. With Everything the, else that I'm trying to do six. is not working. <laughs> what, right. what did that well, look number like Number six, you? yeah. Number six, it was kind of unusual. Again, he was another Mormon. You know, we... we so you we hadn't given up church. on the Mormons yet. <laughs> I had not given it up on the Mormons yet because I kept going to all these singles activities. So he was a nice guy. You know, and he was, well, he was actually 13 years older than me, but he was nice. And we loved to go to dances. So we had fun on the dance floor and he was very charming. And so we got along. We had fun. We had fun. Do we talk about the important stuff? No. Um, did I make sure mm. he got along with my daughter? Did I? Did he make sure I got along with his son that was still living at home? No. It was kind of oh, we were no. focused on our own relationship, and the kids were just kind of in the background. And my daughter was heading off to Japan to be a foreign exchange student. But the, I'm and I'm obviously realizing this now or later. It's like. Oh, I don't really want to be alone while she's gone. Oh, let's get married. Yeah, that must be the solution. Oh, no. oh my goodness. And and we had started dating, and then and I don't know if she'd been approved to go to Japan at the time, but I got married and we didn't live together until after she left for Japan. So we, you know, got married and we lived a few towns apart. So we saw each other obviously on the weekends. And she went to Japan, you know, I moved over to his house. And just a lot of little things. And I was still, you know, I was driving, I don't know, half an hour to an hour to get to my job every day. And, mm -hmm. and I used to sell Avon. So I would, you know, then run around delivering all the orders. And mm -hmm. anyway, it was just, there were a lot of little things. And, you know, so we, there were a lot of little things. And it's not, I don't, I don't remember us having a lot of big fights, but one of the, <laughs> So like, don't, don't get in my personal space, people. And, and I had my computer like set up in a spare bedroom and I came and he was a computer, you know, I, he did a lot of computer stuff at his, his work. And, mm -hmm. um, and he was army. He, he worked at the Presidio, <laughs> you know, married a couple of military guys along the way, but anyway, yeah. I came home one day and he, to be helpful, had rearranged all the icons on my desktop of my computer. It's like, excuse me, you've been in my computer number one and number two. You know, this is where I keep the financial data for you know my, for personal finances and things. Because back then I wasn't, I was not a, I don't think I was a self-employed bookkeeper yet. But mm -hmm. um, and it's like, well, sure, I you know just wanted to clean it up for. It's like, e e don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> and 
And I turned 40 while we were married. And he said, well, where do you want to go for dinner for your birthday? It's like, well, I want to go here. This is like my favorite restaurant. So I get home and we're ready to go out to dinner. He goes, well, we're going to go here because this is where we want to go. It's like, excuse me, did you not listen to what I said I wanted to do when you asked me for this huge birthday? And so we went here. And it's like, ah. Uh. So I had three different girlfriends later take me out to my three favorite restaurants because <laughs> my three favorite restaurants and they each took me out for a birthday dinner on different times. Uh -huh. I've got like four or 40th birthday dinners. Nice. <laughs> It was like my friends listened to me he did not yeah and then I started going to a therapist and I had asked him one day and I'll back up my daughter came back from Japan and he and I were not getting along so I moved in with her for a while and then he came back according and so we started getting along again and so then I moved back in with him but then you know things still were just not great and I started going to a therapist and I said, well, would you go with me? And he goes, no, it's all your problem. It's like, okay, that, that, that's the, it's like, okay. That's it right there. Maybe a year and oh, a year man. and a half. I don't know. I don't even know if we, no, oh, we must've made it to a year, but who knows? I, I don't know at this point. <laughs> it's like, but it took a while to get the divorce. But again, it's like, oh, if you're not goodness. willing to work with me and if you're not willing to like solve the problems together, you know, I, I don't have time for this. Yeah, <laughs> I'm 40. I don't have time. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, uh, you know, it's funny. I always joke around. I'm like, there's something that happens when you turn 40. <laughs> I don't know. Like, there's just something that happens. It's like you just kind of and of course, it, it takes a while sometimes. Like, I know even for me, it took a little while, but it's like, I don't know. It's like I just I didn't take things like I used to take them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's like the switch just gets turned on and, you know, well, like, wait a minute. I don't have to conform to these things. Yeah. And it's just, I, I, I just, I, I lost patience with being with just, you know, being forever forgiving and just letting things play out. I was like, yeah, no, I, <laughs> this is number six. I'm not going to sit around and wait for this. Um, so, you know, we, we got a divorce as well. And I dated a few people in between him and number seven. And I was dating a guy that we were having a lot of fun. He was not a member of the church and we were having a lot of fun. And then my roommate came home one day and said, oh, and her husband was in prison. And she said, well, I met and I'd already been to visit him and, you know, a couple other people. So prison didn't scare me. Um, at least the visiting didn't scare me. If I had to be in prison, that would terrify me. <laughs> Um, cause from just what I hear from my husband, it's, it's, it's not a walk in the park. Let me tell you. Right. Um, well, I she came actually had one of my guests was in prison at one point. And so, yeah, he can attest to that too. Yeah. It's, it's just not a fun place and, um, it's not supposed to be, but it's not a fun place. And she, my roommate said, Oh, I met this really smart guy. He's a friend of my husband's who was visiting his mom and ding, ding smart would be a new kind of boyfriend for me. Let's try smart. And I said, well, you know, I don't, the prison doesn't scare me. So I'm happy to meet him. And he was close to my, we're a year apart. So he was close to my age. So you never, I wouldn't be marrying, you know, so, well, I never married anybody who was too, yeah, way younger than me. Uh, so, but this guy wasn't real old either. And so we started writing because you have to wait to get approved to go meet somebody in person at the prison. Okay. And um, so we were wrote for two months and then I got approved to visit and we started visiting and so we've been visiting for over, you know, probably close to 25 years. And where I lived at the time, I lived close enough so that I could, and visiting was four days a week. I saw him, you know, it's like, at first it was like once a weekend. And then we moved, we happened to move closer to where that prison was because she wanted to be closer to her husband. And um, so then it's like, oh, well, okay, I want to see this guy more. And so now I might, maybe I'm going two days a week. And, it, you know, so obviously ended up, so I was going to visit him four days a week. And then, you know, we started talking about all kinds of stuff. And we started talking about different spiritual things. I'm going, oh, you mean the Mormon church is not the end all be all? And, and no. it's like, oh, I, I, I want to I visit him more than I want to be at church for half the day on Sunday. And and I never had a problem with the church or its teachings or anything. You know, it was my way of life for 30 years. And mm -hmm. I go, oh, I, 
And I don't think it's just like, it's not a hormonal thing because it's not like this guy and I can do anything but hold hands at this point. So that, that was, that was another crucial thing. It's like, we had years to just talk. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Which, which was a whole new thing for both of us. Yeah. And, you know, cause there is no, it's like, it's too bad if the hormones are raging, there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. And there, you know, all you can do is hold hands in this room with a bunch of other people and you can hug and you can have a brief kiss, but it, it's like, and one day I went into my Mormon bishop and I said, Hey, you know, I met this guy, he's at prison and I want to, I want to spend time with him. Like, basically, are you crazy? I go, I may be, but you know, I'm, I'm not going to do this job at church anymore because I'm going to go visit him. And so he and I developed this fabulous rapport and we can talk about a ton of things. And like I said, because the, it's not that the chemistry wasn't there, but it's because we didn't let the chemistry get in the way and it wasn't the focus of our relationship. You know, we talked about food, we talked about cars, we talked about his, his fascinating life. I mean, he grew up as a son of an Air Force officer. So they moved different places in the United States. They lived in Europe. They, they lived in France. They lived in England. And I mean, he's been around the world himself between either his own military stuff and whatever. And, and he be, you know, became a military officer himself, but he got yeah. framed for something he didn't do. And he's been in prison. Technically, he's supposed to be there for the rest of his life. But we're hoping California legislature slops softens up a bit because there's too many people in prison and it's costing the state way too much money yeah. and right now their resources are are thin dealing with fires and covid so um so it's That's it's interesting true. you know again we we talked and courted for five years and then just basically as i go i had a tease and i go you know this was the least romantic proposal i've ever had it's like well you know i it, I don't think he even said, will you, will you marry me? Cause I think we kind of always assumed maybe we would, but at that age, it's like, okay, I'm in my forties. I don't care if I ever get married again. I yeah. don't need, I don't need to be married. I can take care of myself and just marrying you. Isn't going to my, make my life magically better. Cause it's not like you're out here working and you can provide this wonderful life for us. <laughs> Um, he, he used to make a lot of really good money doing military intelligence work, and he had a lot of good investments. And, you know, I but I thought, oh, you know, if he ever got out, we'd be on easy street type of thing. But but obviously that's taken him a long time and he's not out yet. So I'm still taking care of myself, which is fine. I would just love for him to be home. And yeah. but anyway, we courted for five years and we have talked probably more than most married couples, which is huge. And, you know, he's told me, he's talked to his, uh, some other friends who are married and, you know, they'll admit maybe they get a date once a month, every once, every couple months or whatever. It's like, we were having a date every week because I would go and visit him every week unless he was, you know, eight hours away. Cause sometimes they get moved far away mm -hmm. in the state. And, um, but we would have a date two or three, four times a week. They had visiting four times a week. That it was down to three, then it was down to two. Now it's back up to three. But now there's COVID. So when COVID hit, yeah. uh, we have a house in California, and it's only an hour from the current prison he's at. So I would go every Sunday, sometimes Saturday, but it's like every Sunday, like clockwork, I would go. I would get an appointment. I would go see him, and it was so crowded. Maybe we only had an hour and a half, maybe two, maybe three. So that was. But I knew I could go every week, and we also write each other. So for 25 years almost we've written each other almost every day wow 25 so, years i've got boxes of oh, letters <laughs> so and and that's a lost art because we we handwrite we yeah. handwrite letters so i mean and he, sometimes he'll type it i i don't usually type it um and and i know that sometimes my handwriting like, oh gosh my handwriting is getting sloppy but we've handwritten letters for almost 25 years. And, and that's, you know, romantic. Even if it's just like, okay, here's what my boring day was like. And it's Tuesday. So <laughs> the same thing happens every Tuesday. Oh <laughs> and I have goodness. the same clients every Monday. Every It's like, you know, okay, it's art day today. You know, it's like, but, but for us, it's just a way to connect. And he will throw in things like, well, on this day, in this year, this happened. So he gives me all these little snippets of history from the dawn of time. 
and that helps his brain stay that helps his brain stay fresh too because yeah. he knows he knows it gets a little boring but again but it's his it's his thing and even though sometimes I gloss over it but sometimes I have learned a lot it's like oh that happened like oh I wondered when that happened or I never even knew that happened or I never even knew that was a thing yeah <laughs> I I've learned a lot of cool things about history from his letters and you know, but again, it's like we also talk about, you know, we we're both old. You know, it's like now we're really it's like, oh, we're we're, we're finally we're old. It's like, what are we going to do with our house? And, you know, how am I going to how am I going to afford to pick it? I mean, I've been maintaining our house in California, but it is really old and it needs repairs. And it's like, OK, well, do we rent it? Do we you know, it's like the stairs are getting hard on my knees and and um during COVID, I moved to Oregon to be near my daughter because I couldn't see him. It's like, I yeah. saw him in early March of 2020 and then they shut down visiting and it, it went for like a whole year before I could even see him in person again. And they do video chats, but it's really hard to get an appointment for those. And it's hard for us to hear each other when there's people on either side of you talking yeah. into those computers. So it's like, huh, what? Yeah. <laughs> and and um, like, was it April of the, no April of just this last year? I went to see him, but when they opened in-person visiting back up, it was for an hour, and then um, now it's up to two hours. But now they've just suspended visiting again, and we were just supposed to see each other at the end of this month because after 15, 16, 17 years of marriage, the governor let life without parole people have family visits back so we could actually have like two days together at a time so we've had several of those but you know with covid we've we've had two and we were gonna i was gonna go down in january at the end of january for a couple days and now they cancel you know they announced a couple weeks ago they cancel them so it's like Uh i don't know when i'll see him again in person which is like Okay, we're in a, you know, it's like, we're, we're just, and there's so many things you got to talk about that you don't want to talk about in a letter because the guards yeah. and everything. And it's yeah. like, you already know too much of my business. I, I can't get overly romantic in a letter. It's like, you, <laughs> you just, you know, you can't even argue in a letter when you need to get hash something out because then they throw that in his face. Oh, and he goes, right. yeah, I didn't get your nice letters, but I got the grumpy one. They made sure I got the grumpy one. <laughs> So now it's like, okay, and, and here's another thing I've learned. And it's like, yes, I think I'm getting marriage right, but it's taken me, it's like, you know, we've been together for, we've been married 19 years plus, but it's like, you need to keep talking and you need to be courageous enough to say what's on your mind and that, have your voice yeah. be heard. Because I was always the people pleaser and okay, let's do what the man wants. And, and there's been some of that with this husband because he's very charming and he always does seem right. But it's like, I need to say, it's like, well, this is what I'm be- thinking and this is what I'm feeling. And I-, I don't think you're right on this point. And doesn't mean I want an all out war about this topic. It's just, this is what I'm feeling. You know, it's like, you just need to hear me. You don't need yeah. to fix it. And you don't need to blow up at me because I've said something that rubbed you the wrong way in a letter. You should, you know, call me when something like, like, so even at our age and at our length of marriage, we're learning how to do things even, you know, we're learning how to do things better. Yeah. So there's that's always, good. Good for improvement. yeah, so that, that's really good. And the other thing, I think the reason why I'm so, uh, I'm happier now and he and I have always been happy, but I'm happier even now. I mean, COVID allowed me the time to slow down a bit and take more time for myself and All of us, really yeah. go, oh, I'm, I'm a special person. I, I'm, I'm wonderful all by myself. And I started the book before COVID, but I finished the book. And he and I didn't really even talk about the book. Well, we didn't talk about the book while I was writing it. Uh, I was getting feedback from other people and because he's the, he's the writer and you know, he's always been the writer. So it's like, you know, if you're not going to ask me about it, I'm not going to tell you about it. Yeah, and I don't want. Yeah, I don't want. And he 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 really liked it. He goes, I've read it several times because I'll say. So what is it? Let's talk just a couple minutes about it. What is your book? The book is Midlife Magic. OK, so it is. I know. And 
it's like like you said the time goes by so fast i know <laughs> I that's it. all right because um, we're gonna have to i'm gonna have to get you back on when he gets out to. of prison because i can't wait to to see the you know how the story <laughs> kind of unfolds even more so but yeah Good. let's talk well, a little the bit book about in a book. nutshell is is my is my life story and i i do a huge chapter on my childhood and how i grew up and then there's a chapter on why i kept getting married and why marriage in general was important to me and then mm -hmm. each each husband gets a chapter and i did name them and i've had somebody say you should probably just go back and number them so they don't sue you i go well two of them are dead so they're not going to sue me and i don't yeah. really care if the other three try because they were idiots <laughs> so they've probably not even read the book but you know, well, I'll think about it in another edition if I'm going to just number people. Yeah. Mark gets three chapters because I talk about how we met, how we courted, what it's like to be a prison wife, just the logistics of what you go through to be married to somebody in prison and what it's like to visit, those kind of things. And then because of his military career and because of his uniquely weird childhood, I know about fairies, I know about UFOs, I know about aliens, and I've had my own, and, and I've, I was already into the paranormal because I can sense ghosts and spirits around me anyway, um, but he introduced me to this whole other, you did what in the military? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? You, you went where? You went to space? <laughs> There's a, a military space program? So... Yep. <laughs> I, I I got thrown into this whole nother weirdly wonderful side of my life. So half the books about the bad husbands and lessons I learned on mm -hmm. the bad the bad marriages, and you know a chunk on Mark, and then um, several chapters on my my UFO sightings, my experiences with the paranormal, my experiences with elementals or the fairy realm, and then my my path on magic and how I it involve that in my life and I use my intuition and how I protect myself. And then just about taking back my power and realizing that I am a worthwhile person because that's not the message I got when I was married so many times before. It's yeah. like, you know, I'm the man, I'm the only one that counts. You're just the woman. And it's like, okay, no. I am a badass, powerful woman. Nice. And yes. I may be, it's like, I have to live another 40 or 50 years because there's so much other cool stuff I want to do with my life besides bookkeeping. And, <laughs> you know, my grandkids could care less than I'm a bookkeeper. They think it's so cool that I've written this book and, you know, grandma does <laughs> magic and, you know, grandma believes in this weird stuff. And it's like, it's not weird to me. It's just part of my life. And, yeah. You know, it, it that doesn't have to be. It's like my my point is, it doesn't matter what age you are. You can change your life. You can make it better. You can find what's the new, the best way for you to be. Amen you know, to that. Find what's yes. Working for you and take care of yourself. Yes. It's like there's nothing wrong with going to get a massage or taking a long bath or just not working 24 hours a day. And yeah. Some sleep or just sitting reading. You yeah. Know, it's no, just you have good. to take care of yourself. And I think my yeah. my. Mark, my current husband, he's seeing, he, he is seeing that I'm a lot happier. Not that I knew that I was unhappy, but he's seeing that I'm a lot happier. And, you know, as long as we, you know, it's like we're learning to deal with the new, the new assertive joy. <laughs> oh, man. Well, we all have to go through that process. And I mean, yeah, I'm definitely yeah. one that has gone through it too. And, and I'm going through it, you know, so yeah. mine gets to, he gets to learn too. And, you know, it's just, <laughs> hey you're either with me or you're not <laughs> like that, that's right you know it's like this is the, this is how i am dude you know i'm choosing you so hopefully you'll choose me and we'll keep yeah. going <laughs> oh man well joanne i hate that i have to you know finish know. this up but we definitely keep me posted on things because I will. yeah when he gets out i just can't wait to see you know a couple months in you know how it goes and and just you know when you're actually with them i mean the fact that, that, that we stuck great, with them for 25 years so much is fun, awesome you know our two days you know it's like they go by so fast and he cooks for me and pampers me and it, it's wonderful so it's oh, like <laughs> and it, even though when he gets out um i know that i go i know you'll be back right doing the same military stuff you it's like not like we're gonna sit home 
and be, you know, these quiet retired people because we both have things to do. But yeah. at least you'll be home and we'll have more time together than we have now. So for sure. For sure. Yeah. So yeah. Uh well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Hey everybody, thank this you. has been another great episode of Breaking Barriers Now. Uh today we have Joanne Richards. Go check out her book. Definitely, she's gonna keep us posted on things as they begin to unfold, and I'll have her back on when when that happens. So thanks again, Great. Joanne. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You take care.